Good day and welcome to Amazing Apps. I'm your host, Neil Benson. Thanks for joining me. You know, every now and again, someone asks you a question that challenges one of your long-held beliefs. I used to believe it was possible to write a perfect requirement specification, and that was the secret to a successful software project. Then I was introduced to Scrum and realized my long-held belief was a fallacy. There's no such thing as a perfect requirement specification. And you can have a successful software project without any requirement specification at all. Today's guest on Amazing Apps challenges another of my long-held beliefs. You should never build your own business application. There are hundreds of apps to choose from in every category. The popular ones that we know, marketing, sales, service, HR, supply chain, commerce, finance, operations, project management, you name it. You'd be mad to suffer the cost and the maintenance nightmare of building your own business applications. Martin Hinshelwood from Naked Agility challenges my belief. He reckons there are times when you can gain more competitive advantage by building your own business app than you can by buying one. It's not as if he doesn't know what he's talking about either. Martin was a developer for 13 years and has been training and coaching software development teams for the past 10 years. He's a professional Scrum trainer and a professional Kanban trainer. Martin also has been a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies for the past 15 years, specializing in GitHub and Azure DevOps. Fair to say then, he's got some credibility when it comes to custom dev on the Microsoft platform. Join me as he brings his insights into our world of Microsoft business applications. This is Amazing Apps 146. You'll find show notes, a transcript and resources at Amazing Apps dot show slash one four six. Here's Martin. Martin Henshawood. Oh man, it's good to have you on Amazing Applications. Welcome to the show. It is great to be here. Martin, I think you have a somewhat controversial idea. I'd love to dive into it. Most Microsoft customers would be better building their own business applications rather than buying something that's prepackaged like Dynamics 365 ERP or, or customer engagement apps. Tell us more. I'd love to, to, to dive into your point of view. Well, I'm also going to caveat that point of view and say, well, it depends. Right? <laughs> okay. Definitely there's some depends in there. It's not always the wrong thing to do, but I have this fundamental idea that um, the reason organizations were successful in the first place the reason yours was the startup that was successful when others failed, and even that applies to organizations that have been around for a hundred years, they were at some point a startup, right? Yeah. Um, the reason that they're successful is because they do something unique that no other company does. They're filling a niche in the market. Um, they're filling it in a way that enables them to respond to that market better and therefore be more likely to be successful than other, other organizations. And the idea that you should suborn that to somebody else's business practices, that you're, you're potentially risking your unique niche and your unique capability in that market, because you're saying our business is procurement, right? Right. So we're going to buy uh, Dynamics 365. And we're going to use Dynamics. I, I can't remember. There's a whole bunch of packages that Dynamics 365 has for different markets, right? That's right. So let's say it's the, the trucking industry, right? I'm sure they have a... Here's the package for you're a trucking company, right? And you've got to get packages into trucks and across the world. Yeah. If every company buys it, what's the difference between these companies? Hmm. What's the uniqueness that enables this company to be more successful than this company? Well, it's gone because you're all doing it exactly the same way. So then somebody else will come into the market, do it in a unique way and take that business away. And then eventually they'll get big enough to buy dynamics and then they're the same as everybody else. And then a new company will come in to take that market away because they do something unique and then they'll buy dynamics and yeah. the same as everybody else. Right. So that's interesting. And, in, in Australia here, there's, um, there's a couple of big heavy equipment manufacturers, Komatsu, um, Hitachi, 
a caterpillar. You know, they make big bulldozers and excavators and those kinds of things. Lots of there's a lot of mining in Australia. So there's lots of mining equipment, and there's an anata, which is a heavy equipment ISV sits on top of Dynamics 365, really popular in Australia. But all those manufacturers compete against each other. And if they all use the same software, how can they stand out? How can they compete against each other with the same fundamental software? Interesting. Yeah, because well, don't think about it as software, right? The, the software implements your business practices. That's what right. software is for, right? It, it enables and automates your business practices. So if you buy it, you're buying the business practices along with the software. Right? True. Yep. And that's the bit that, that loses your, your uniqueness. I used to work with a, a company in, in Utah called Backcountry. They're a great, great company to, to, to work with. And when I worked with them, they're a clothing company. They do sports, sportswear. Yep. Your ski helmets and your goggles and your, 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 I, I don't know what's other sports, but it was mainly ski focused where they were in utah was right next to where the olympics were held uh down there in uh salt lake city. city park i can't remember what's, what's that salt lake city yes but there's a there's, there's a there's a place a town up in the mountains oh, which is where okay. the actual like they have the, the ski resort, ramp and yeah. stuff yeah, yeah, yeah they they're a company of uh, at the time i think it was about nine between 96 and 98 people in the whole company that's ceo all the way down procurement worldwide um, and 48 of them were software engineers. So how, how far do you take them, it? 48 so, of them were Java developers. So wow. but they, they, they built and supported their entire procurement pipeline. So they have software that, that helps them interact with the warehouses in China that enables them to, to, to book and pull in the goods. They have the software that manages all of their warehouses in the US. They have an iPad app that sits on the, the forklift, right? The guy driving right. around in the forklift trying to find the stuff in the warehouse. Where do I put it? What? How do I move stuff around? How do I find stuff? And um, they run all of their points of sale. They have um, multiple web, what, do you, what would you call them? Properties, web-based properties, right? I think that's the way they describe them, right? They, they, they had multiple websites that look like different brands to you and I, yeah. but they're all part of their thing. And they each, each of these actual different websites had a different unique proposition, the way they sold, the way they, the way the, the, the people buy that was something unique. So they kind of even competed against themselves. Okay. So they've got from consumer all the way through to manufacture. Is their system software? It's, the, so it's I, their own their own systems that they support and maintain. And anytime somebody says we'd like this to work differently, no problem, we'll do it. Right? Because it's we own the we own the full stack. Yeah. We're not relying on a third party software vendor. We're not relying on the way Dynamics inherently works, and we're stuck. We can re-architect whatever it is we want in order to be able to successfully take advantage of that market opportunity. So I, I can imagine companies who compete on supply chain excellence, right? The speed to market, they can go from manufacturer to product in store in weeks, you know, sure. Many times faster than the competition. They might, it might be worthwhile investing in custom software to enable that competitive advantage. But you know, I'm, I'm a small business owner. I'm not going to hire a developer and yeah. build an accounting system. There's dozens nope. of off-the-shelf accounting it. systems. I'm going to buy it. Yep. I don't. I don't compete based don't on care. the quality of my accounting. So I'm not. I'm not I don't care as long as it meets my my minimum needs. Yes. But if, so it, that, that was going to be that was my caveat that I said. <laughs> okay. Right? If it's not your core business, don't build it. Buy it. You're right. Okay. I don't build a a a, a document storage system. I have SharePoint. Right. Yep. I don't buy a file sharing system. I have OneDrive. I don't buy, I don't build any of those things because they're not part of my core business. But I do go build a bunch of stuff around agile and student management, right? I have my own, I've, I've looked at getting somebody else's course student management system. Oh, there's only a couple of hundred LMSs out there to choose from. Well, it's not, it's not, they're not, it's not really LMS. L LMS is something, learning management is something different to, okay. um, 
uh, training management, right? So this is what courses do you have? Where are they published? People being able to find them and purchase the course. And, and I built my own system because that's part of my core business. And whenever I've gone, oh, this is so frustrating. It's so much effort. It's so hard to go do this. And I've gone and looked at third-party systems out there. Like, I don't know, the Arlo is probably Ar a big one. Ar the one that springs yeah, to mind, yeah. yeah. In, in Australia. I've had a number of conversations with them about how, how can I use their system. And every single time I run, in, I run into the point very quickly where I need to change my business, my yes. core business practices in order to be able to, to support it. So for example, um, I offer different prices worldwide, depending on where you are in the world, right? And that's out of the box in my system. It detects, Geo detects you uh, right. where you are. So if you're in Australia, I think Australia's full price. Uh, but if you're <laughs> in, if you're in Spain, right? There's a 25% discount because Spain's a non-primary market. If you're in Africa, it's a 50% discount on any of my classes, right? And that, that capability is not in any of the platforms that are, are, are out there. So I would have to remove that thing, that unique selling, that unique business proposition for my customers mm. in order to then use that standard system. Well, Arlo, I, when I spoke to Arlo, they did say there, there are ways you can do it, but it would require so much. You'd have to create a different course for each country. Yes, I've seen that done before. I have one course that I publish and it's everything else is automatic. So from an admin standpoint, this is a much better way to do it, right? Okay. So I, I can see what you're saying. So there are some companies in some industries where Dynamics 365 makes sense because it's a prepackaged yeah, application. Yeah. They can configure it. It's not where they compete. They just want a pretty good customer service system. They just want a pretty good sales application or pretty good financial management application. They You're compete not selling me on else. dynamics there with it only being pretty good. I, I think if you just in, I was going to say install it. It doesn't come on CDs anymore. But if you just yeah, uh, yeah. you know subscribe to the basic application, it's it's pretty good. You just you can yeah, and yeah. should configure I, it and customize it to your business. I, I've looked I've looked at it for CRM, and I've actually it has a it has a training management plugin as well. Mm. Uh, yeah, there are there are people who built industry applications on top of it for managing schools yep. and courses and students and online. Yep, um, there are. So uh, I remember taking a tour of the SpaceX factory in uh, Torrance, California, when I lived just down the road in Manhattan Beach. Wonderful, amazing, amazing place. And I was in software there. I was running a Microsoft practice for Slalom Consulting. And when I asked the tour guide, he was one of the managers at SpaceX, you know, do you, do you use any Microsoft software? Do you use any, you know, anybody else's software? It's like, nope, it's wall to wall yep. custom, right? There just yep. aren't any software vendors who make software for the rocket ship industry. So well, I, we have a couple of it, off the shelf applications, but it's mostly custom. But I was reading a, 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 an article about Ford and Ford was saying, or somebody from somebody in leadership in Ford was saying that they're having an absolute nightmare right now because they outsourced every component in the cars, all of the digital systems in the cars. And they've got 130 different vendors. I'm, I'm making up that number. It was, some, it was in the hundred and something, right? 130 different vendors that all build different parts of the car and all have to interact with each other. And now they're trying to compete with the likes of Tesla and they need connected coherent strategy systems in order to be able to do that and they're like we don't have any capability to do this we don't have any capability in house we we yep. we're starting from zero in figuring out how do we how do we compete with that idea of the unique niche yeah they outsource some of their core business which is always a bad idea and that applies not just at the technology level, but it also applies at the business level. When you bring in the 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 the, the McKinsey's or the BSGs or even even to a certain extent the Accentures, right, of the world, they're bringing skills that you don't have, but you tend to inherently rely on those skills. And as soon as you rely on them, you stop building them internally, and then sure. you need those skills yep. in order to 
be able to function. Yeah. Um, and that's outsourcing your core business practices, right? Yeah. It's the different levels. That's right. And hello to all of our listeners at Accenture. We love you. <laughs> um, um, so we, we talked I do, about I do lots of training for folks at Accenture. There's lots of great folks at Accenture. Yes. Oh, cool. I'm meaning holistically. Accenture's <laughs> actually been around a very long time. I think it was started in the 30s. 30s or well, it, it was the it, it was the consulting of the old Anderson Consulting. Um, business. Yeah, 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 that's what it uh, was. I'm, I'm reading I'm reading a, a a book at the moment called the 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 is it called the Great Con or the Big Con? I think it's called the Big Con, um, and it's about the consulting companies and McKinsey and BSG and and how they've taken core business practices away from yeah. businesses and governments. Yeah, it's really interesting. Somewhere in the middle between building all of your own custom software to support your unique competitive advantage and buying an off the shelf industry solution. Microsoft's got an offering called Power Platform, Power Apps, yep. Power BI, right. Power Automate, where you can compose your own business application and it, it's designed to, to fit unique needs. I'm, yes. I build building or I manage buildings, big commercial office blocks and stuff. And I need an application to manage all of the, the machinery that's in there when it was serviced and, um, who looks after it and how, how long the, how strong the cable is and is it green certified and how much CO2 it uses and yeah. all those kinds of things. I could build a, an app on power platform, hopefully with, I don't have to have half of my company being software developers. Um, sure. But, um, how, you know, is, is there a movement there you're, that you're seeing with not just the Microsoft power platform, but other low code, no code kind of build your own or compose your own I, applications? I think, I think um, I think there is, but I think it has stalled. And the reason it's stalled is because very quickly folks that go to try and create things in Power Platform realize that they still need these uber techie people to be able to figure it out. Right? It's not actually you. You have to be a fairly smart business person. A fairly uh, what's that? You know. You know, like there's there's a reason that some people become MVPs and other people don't, right? It's because you've got that interest in learning and conversing and sharing, and you you actually yep. need to be that person if you're in the business world to be able to do something well with Power Apps. It's not as easy as it sounds, right? I've tried some stuff and failed, right? And I, and I have <laughs> a technical background. Perhaps that's a limitation, right? Perhaps, that's a limitation. <laughs> Perhaps yeah. I'm like, I'm gonna do it this way, but it won't let me. Um, but I think with um, the new stuff coming down the line from 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 Copilot, I mentioned that before, from Copilot, that will enable the request from the the business person to be more easily turned into something that they can use right away. Yep will enable a much bigger explosion of lots of these smaller apps. I, I guess I'm just a little bit, the developer in me is a little bit horrified that we're returning to the access database world, right? Yes, yes, the Lotus uh, Notes. That, uh, that, that you'll go, you'll go into, into a business and you'll have this half-assed implementation that they're running. That, I, I used to work for a little company called Merrill Lynch um and at merrill lynch I wonder whatever they, happened to in, them yeah what happened to them um i funnily enough the department i was working in was a subprime mortgage department pre-2008 <laughs> right so but the the entire the entire decision making process for whether you get a mortgage or not the calculator the the, the analysis tool was built in excel okay Okay. The, the whole the whole business the whole business ran on this this well the decision making for the business didn't run on that tool right the the the, the all of the the Modeling call center the people would have that a copy Excel of Excel tool, copy of Excel and they would plug in uh, the numbers and then it would tell them whether they can give them a mortgage and what rates they can give them um, oh. and funnily enough the person that made it had left the company and they had the passwords to open up crack <laughs> open Excel. And it was all formula. I, I managed. I was tasked with making an app for it, right? And it was just, it was all. It was not not absolutely not code based. It was formula based, right? The entire thing was formula based. And I I, I just like it looked like regex expressions to me. Um, <laughs> but 
I, there's inherent business risk in that, right? But I think the reality is without risk, there's no reward. And businesses, especially when you're starting up, you need to take a bit of risk and build some stuff. And perhaps Power Apps is the best way to 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 get some stuff that just solves little bits and pieces of your yep. problem. I actually I actually prefer the Toyota model than the the Toyota model is that they 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 don't build one massive production line, right? Because then you're stuck with this whole process. They build little bits of automation, so you've got all these points with a human in the mix where you can make adaptations and changes and catch problems. Yep. That was the, the stop the, the assembly line if you need to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, and, and it meant that they were able to more easily adapt their processes because it wasn't one big monolithic process. And that goes to something you mentioned earlier, you were talking about upgrading a system, right? You've got a project that you've been working on where uh, we've got this existing system in place. And we can't go live until we've built the whole new thing. Yes, right. That's quite and common. That that yeah. that yeah 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 that that's it's really common. Um, I I would definitely suggest that's the wrong way to approach that problem, right? That 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 I've seen too. I call them the mythical rewrite, and I've seen too many of them fail quite often because they're a cost center. They're not a value center, right? They're not actually producing value until they get that first version of the product. Oh yeah, for sure. It's it's a long time before you extract that that you know first dollar of return on investment, and um, I've I've often tried to find ways of breaking it up. How can we get this thing into production quicker? Can we go with a smaller team or a division over here or or the, just that department um, yeah. and get them onto the new app with half the features of the entire app? There's lots of ways that we've, I, we've tried to do it. I'm, I'm getting better at it, but it, we're not there yet. I usually say whatever your sprint length is or whatever your 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 shorter cadence if you're not doing scrum whatever your iteration length is um i usually i usually say to teams you get a highly skilled technical team that can figure this out right and just say to them if you've only got a month if you've only got 14 days what what can we ship in 14 days that will help make this system better and focus on that and yep. just do that every 14 days. So it's actually at the end of the first 14 days, you want to be in production. You absolutely want to be in production. You want to have something in production because that's the bit that tells you that you're on the right track, right? That you can actually do something in right. this space. And it might be that the COBOL system has to call out to your little service and then your little service calls back into COBOL, right? And you're just taking this algorithm or formula or whatever it is out yep. yes we were able to do that right how many more of those can we do before yeah. the system starts operating well yeah so if, um, if you're going to replace i don't know customer service and a contact center you might just start with a a caller verification app and all it does is go mr henshawood what's your date of birth what's your address verified and that, that's all it does and then it goes off to the legacy yep. system and, and does the rest of the business transaction or you want to update your address or you want to initiate an insurance claim, whatever it is you called in for, we can help you with that in the old system. But we verified you in the new system that the IT team built for us two weeks ago. So the biggest fallacy with the with the mythical rewrite is that you need all of the things that the old system does. Yep. That's the argument Which, I hear every day. Yep. It, it, you, the customer comes to you and says, I need it to do everything that this does. It's like, really? Do you really need it to do everything that it does? Because you know that the industry average is that 65% of the features that you built in your application are not used by your customers, are not used at all. So how about we don't build that 65% and we only build the 35% that's actually used right now. Yep. And then you can spend that other 65% of the time on other more valuable new stuff, stuff that yeah. solve new business problems. Yep. Right? But it, yeah, it's really hard to have that conversation because um, I find that the biggest barrier to any engineering project, we're all Australian here, we can be a bit blunt, right? <laughs> sure. Um, the, the, the biggest barrier to building of new stuff, of updating the existing stuff that we've got so that we keep it current, so that we maintain, we don't end up like British Airways, right? Where our system's down half the time because it's it's calling into the mainframe that nobody knows how it works anymore, nope. um, is, is, is the incompetence of business. That, that's ultimately what it is. It's, it's business folks that 
don't understand that their business runs on the software and if they don't understand the software that's the biggest risk to their business is their lack of understanding of what it is they're buying what it is they're paying for what it is they're asking for and how they're asking for it, it I, I don't know about you but have you ever have you ever bought a tv um not recently TV? but yes i bought i bought, uh, I bought, I bought when, TVs. when you buy when you buy a tv do you just walk into a store and say sell me a tv and take whatever tv the person that sells you it in the store whatever one they get the best commission on right <laughs> It's, Very rarely. No, I do my homework. I do my research. No. I compare yeah, all the reviews. You go, and... you, go, you go find out what what are the what are the different TV capabilities that are out there. What's the cost benefit ratio? Maybe you look up some expert advice on what good yep. TVs look like today. Uh, do I need this or do I need that? And then you go into the store and you find that. But that's not how most businesses buy their software or commission software. They're like, here's a bunch of stuff I need. Go make it happen. Don't ask mm. me any questions, right? <laughs> And that, that that's for me. It's yeah, it happens all the time. But this is yep. this is the that's these are core business decisions that you're outsourcing. Again, we're back to the core business, right? Yes. You're taking this. You're putting it in the hands of somebody else who is not in your business, who doesn't really care that much whether you're successful as long as you pay the bill at the end of the day. And that that's that's for me is all business risk. Yeah. So I love this idea of getting the business folks more involved in building the software, um, yeah. giving them a tool like Power Apps or whatever it is to to compose business applications that they have far more interest in and a stake in. But business folks, uh, regardless of how nerdy or geeky they, they are, want to be, they, they maybe don't have any experience collaborating, yep. building software, planning, executing, releasing into production, testing stuff to make sure it doesn't break, um, migrating data from production. How do we form teams composed of business folks with no software development experience and a, sprinkle in a couple of software developers and give them a framework that they can use to collaborate and, and build a complex product? Is Scrum the answer there? Or did, is it overkill for business folks to try and train them and, and bring them into a Scrum team? No, I, I mean, I, I, I bring lots of business folks into Scrum teams as, as product owners. Yes. Right. So that, that that product owner accountability in Scrum is something that I would normally see maybe a product manager on the customer side or uh, a program, maybe a program manager on the customer side, somebody that the customer sees as who's the head of this program, who's the person that's going to be making the decisions about this product and this this that that, that we're building. Yep. That's that's. You don't need to be your job title doesn't need to be product owner for you to be a product owner, right? I've, just ne a... I've never worked with a product owner in all my business apps projects um, who have any experience with dynamics before, yeah. with being a product owner before. Um, we, we teach them all of that as we go along. They need domain so, expertise, so they need authority, and they need division. And you know, those I did are... work with ISV years ago, many years ago, who would whoever the customer um, said this is going to be your your product owner, they had in the contract, they had to provide somebody who was who yep. was the product owner. Um, they, they, they would say to that person, have you been on, have you, have you done product owner training? Do you understand what a product owner is? No, 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 I don't understand that. There's a course on this date. Off yes. you go, we'll pay. Yeah, okay. The ISV paid, right? Because yep. it benefits the ISV if the What's customer understands what the heck you're talking about, yep. right? Yep. That they, they, they understand, because the, the course, the, the product owner doesn't need to understand the technical nuance of the product, right? They need to understand enough to trust the team. That's that's they do need they do need a little bit of understanding of 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 the complexities of building building products, right? But what they do need to understand is 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 value. They need to understand agile product management. They need to understand trade offs. They need to understand the hypothesis driven engineering, right? They need to need to understand the impact of making a particular change on not just the financial impact, but also the impact that it can have on the business. And how do you monitor that impact so that you can maximize the value and return on investment for the business yeah. that they're giving you the money and you're spending it well. I think there's a, really a political new... impact as well. Do you think there's a, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna please some stakeholders by making a decision in their favor and you're gonna piss off another one because some stakeholders gonna have to you know, defer their favorite requirement. Yeah, some stakeholders suck, don't they? <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
I actually wanted to to because there was two things that we talked about, right? You you talked about the customer. Well, I talked about the customer being the product owner, and having somebody that actually understands what they're doing is 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 totally awesome. That cares as well, right? They have yeah. to care. But there's a little bit that's on us as engineers um, that that we're not we're not really engineers anymore. There's a great uh, blog post by uh, Barry Overstein, uh, Barry Overstein from the Liberators in 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 the Netherlands, and he talked about um, all he he was he did had a generalization, but all developers are now product developers. So there's a difference. There, there are certain. There's certainly the place out there for the the Uber coder who doesn't care about anything else but the code, right. and is building APIs and building. Or we've got we've got people on our team that yeah, this is the person who does all of the cool crazy stuff, right? That 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 really. I've met a few of those. Yes. There's totally the place for those folks, um, but the bit that's missing on lots of teams is like you're saying politics, right? Product developer. There's a difference between a, a coder and a product developer. Right. A product developer is somebody who doesn't just understand the technical nature of the product, who doesn't doesn't just able to code or able to test or able to do the things that they're able to do, but they're also able to um, communicate with the customer. They understand marketing as well, right? So the way the way I definitely think about it is one of the hardest things that teams hit is getting uh, people into their sprint review. Um, yes. <laughs> like, how do you get stakeholders to turn up at your sprint review? And it's actually a really simple answer. Build stuff they care about and talk about stuff they care about and don't talk about stuff that they don't care about. I, I go into so many sprint reviews and the team's like, here's the cool database triggers that we made this sprint. <laughs> and I'm like, the customer doesn't give a crap. In fact, yeah. look, that customer is about to, drop off the call yep. and isn't coming back next sprint. I've, I've had a couple where um, we're just going to show you a quick demo in Postman that the API we built is working. Yeah, I uh, saw oh, oh, it's come like, on. Like, what we can do better doing? than that. <laughs> so, so the thing that I think is that there's a, there's a thing in Scrum that's a, 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 a I'm going to say solution to that problem. It's not holistic, right? But is a uh, medicine for that problem. And that's that uh, we have something called the sprint goal. Yes. And the mistake that teams make is they think that the sprint goal needs to be the whole sprint, right? That's the mistake that, that, that teams make. But no, it doesn't. The sprint goal could be 5% of the sprint. It could be 10% of the sprint. But the sprint goal is your marketing story with your stakeholders. What are we going to show you at the end of the sprint that's going to wow you and show you that we're working towards your goals and your success? And yeah, we have to spend 90% of the rest of the time writing postman scripts and uh, <laughs> database triggers yeah. and building cool architectures and setting up servers, but your customer doesn't give a crap, right? No. They, want, they want the cool thing, that they, the value that they can see. So it's perfectly okay to have a sprint goal that's a subset of all of the other work that has to happen. And we don't show that other work at the sprint review because the customer doesn't care. Yeah. And if you, if you do have a customer that some people care and some people don't, then front load the value and rear load the technical and then yeah. have a point in the sprint review where you say, Thank we're going to start talking coming. about some technical yeah. stuff. If you're not interested in that stuff, perhaps you can drop off and here's what we're going to talk about next, next, yep. next. Yeah. Sprint, um, right? So sprint goals for me, I, I've, um, one thing I'm trying to do more now is, is help my teams write a sprint goal that's nice and short and sexy. So I could put it in the outlook invitation subject line, send it to my stakeholders. And it's, it's an irresistible yeah. outlook invitation. I have got to go to that review to see that feature in two weeks time. Got to clear my calendar. I've got to go to that meeting or that event, that workshop, whatever you want to call it. But um, yeah, if it's it's like writing a great podcast episode title. It's it's got to be, uh, you know, the, the the sexiest thing that Neil and Martin talked about in a thirty minute conversation distilled into exactly. ten words. Yeah. yeah, or less, right? You 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 need to it. But this is this is that marketing proposition, yes. right? But in the dynamics of the Scrum team. This, this is the product owner's, part of the product owner's accountability, which is 
compounded when you work in professional services and your 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 customer is is the product owner and if they're not engaged in that process you then have this gap where you have this massive communication difference between what it is you're trying to say and what the business actually needs so you you can never solve that uh, we we've, we've been i've been working with a number of professional services organizations and i've come round to the idea um, that we need something called a consulting product owner on the technical site yeah okay. i'm going to be yeah this is this is so um i'm 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 trading a fine line here between there's one product owner yes i'm right? wondering where this is going right? there's still one product owner but what do you as a team do if the person who has been assigned it, and this is specifically for professional services, right? Because you are in company A, your product owner is in company B, your customer, yes. and you need to interact with that person, but they've got no clue. They're just a BA, a lowly BA who's been assigned this this thing that they don't really know what it is. I'm, you know, being dramatic, but that that's, <laughs> does quite often happen, and. Um, they've got no idea what they're doing. How how do we fill that gap? Because there's a gap now between yeah. what the team needs and what the product owner can provide. So the idea of the consulting product owner is somebody who, um, or product owner coach, yeah, how you okay. really want to call it, is somebody who can do the role of the product owner so they can fill that gap between the customer and the team but their main purpose is to increase the capability of the product owner and the customer. Because if the, if the customer understands Agile better, understands the ramifications of the choices that they make, understands how important these, I, you know, we're talking about empiricism, we're talking about hypothesis-driven engineering, we're talking about data, all the, the data analysis and all those kind of things. If they understand yeah. that, you're going to be more successful as the ISV, right? As the professional services company, yep. you're going to be more successful in your engagement with the customer. So it's on you to help train and coach and mentor your customer towards a greater degree of the agility that you want your teams to be able to do. I 99% agree with what you've, the idea you're, you're putting forward. I'd say the 1% reservation I have is, isn't that the job of the Scrum Master? Isn't one of their responsibilities or accountabilities to coach the product owner in, in the application of Scrum and, and empiricism and hypothesis driven development and all those um so things you just said yes but and i know you're supposed to say yes and but yes but the scrum master is focused on the effectiveness of the team and yes they're supposed to also focus on the effectiveness of the product owner and the effectiveness of the organization and in the context of a team inside of a company delivering inside of company a delivering to company a yes or delivering a commercial product inside of company A, I would 100% agree with you. It's the scrum master's job. But in the professional services world, I'm not going to expect my scrum master to also be an account manager, to also perhaps have to deal with, I don't know, invoicing and politics within, yes. within the customer's company. Because the difficulty that we, we're running into here that I mentioned why it's specific to professional services is you've got this awesome team. They were working with this customer. You've built it up to be this awesome slick machine, right? That we're all doing awesome. Ad everything is apps. Everything is awesome. We're part of a team, right? And then they move off this engagement and they get a new customer. That's a waterfall customer. Yes. Doesn't work. Now, now we've got a problem, right? Yep. And then this engagement's only six months, and then they move off that onto another customer. I feel like you need somebody in your ISV who is a professional organizational change agent. 
mm. who you, it's, it's your ninja for fixing your customers so that they can better engage with you and you can build more value and they want more work from you rather than that endless cycle of disaster and pain that happens in every single engagement with the customer where at the end of the day you're getting out the contract and poking at it yeah yeah if you if you're in an engagement and you're getting at the contract and you're poking at it you're screwed yeah you're so that, that's my life I, i've spent 20 years as a microsoft partner working with Microsoft customers trying to deliver great products. It's it's typically most of the developers work for my organization, the partner organization. Some of them will, will, will co-opt from the customer organization. That's great. The product owner is almost always, I've never worked with a product owner who wasn't part of the customer organization. And I don't really care who's, who supplies the Scrum Master, as long as they're competent. Um, they can be an independent, they could be a, a, from an agile consultancy, they could be from the customer's organization or from ours. Um, all of those work well. Um, but it's the product owner. The customer needs to provide a really top quality person that we can coach into yeah. that product owner accountability. Uh, fascinating. That's um, yeah. That's that's the challenge we work with every day. I'm sh I'm sure the folks on the podcast are all either nodding their heads or they're crying with their head in between their legs right now. <laughs> because they might very well be in that exact situation, right? Yeah. Um, Martin, it's been a fascinating discussion. Have you got a few minutes to stay behind? I'd love to do a quick retrospective with you and get to know you a little bit better. Um, for the folks who've really enjoyed this discussion, you and I were just sharing a story about our, our Microsoft MVP awards and how long we've been in, in that ecosystem as well. You've been a, an MVP since 2008. Did you want to share with the folks yeah. um, back home who who might not uh, recognize your name, you know, where your expertise lies in the Microsoft ecosystem, because that's a fascinating story there too. Yeah, so so back in back in uh, probably 2005, 2006, I started working with a little product called uh, Visual Studio Team System. And I started poking the APIs is what I started doing. And I, right. and I built a whole bunch of things. I don't know if anybody remembers one of the first demo applications for WPF, where it had a family tree I don't remember. I had a family tree. It was like a family tree application that loaded in a bunch of XML data and showed a family tree and you could save it out. Um, well, I, I copied that and I basically changed the code so it loaded work items out of uh, Team Foundation Server and visualized them on the with all the links right. and things that were going on. Um, and I just published it and I got a bunch of kudos for that. And that's probably one of the things that, that I built a bunch of other stuff around that idea of APIs and I got my MVP in, in 2008, but that very quickly launched my career, mm. right? It's a, it's definitely a great accolade to help people see that you're doing something right. Microsoft says this person's doing something interesting and I very quickly moved into becoming a DevOps consultant. Um, so I was a software engineer for for probably eight, eight, nine, nine years. Software engineer, being paid, being paid. Yes. I started writing code when I was eight years old. But, <laughs> uh, being paid to write software for nine years. And then I became a DevOps consultant. Um, and I worked in Seattle. Um, I moved to the US. I lived in Seattle for three years, uh, being a, a consultant there. And then moved back to the UK, started my own business at Naked Agility and have been doing that doing that ever since i saw on linkedin it's like third no it's 10 years 10 years i'm like oh, congratulations oh awesome yeah i've been doing it for 10 years and, and the journey so from my... from there into you're now a professional scrum trainer yeah um uh... i actually became a professional scrum trainer way back in 2010 but i didn't do a lot with it right. I, I did the odd class i did the odd training um, but I really, I came in from the developer side. So the professional Scrum developer class that Scrum.org had back in the day, it's now the applying professional Scrum for software developers um, that Richard Hunthausen built, who's an awesome, awesome. Uh, he was a guest on our podcast a few, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. Yeah, love Richard. Richard, awesome. Uh, so he got me into this, this Scrum thing. Um, and then it's just kind of, I guess it's festered and taken over since then. And these days, almost all of the engagements that I do are 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 Scrum and Kanban and process based. But quite often, people find me because of my Azure DevOps expertise, right? Right. Uh, so most of my customers are definitely on the Microsoft stack. 
Brilliant. So if, if any of our customers are listening or if, if anybody is listening and they're a Microsoft customer or partner and they think, oh, I could do with some of Martin's expertise, what kind of engagements do you love doing, enjoy doing, and um, how can folks get in touch with you? <laughs> quite often, quite often uh, short ones, I like to help people. And I find that um, I'm not, not um, usually a butt on a seat for, for six months with an organization. I don't think that helps. Um, organizations have the right people. They just don't may maybe have the have the um, I don't know the get up and go to go uh, make change and do things differently. Um, so I, I like to come into organizations and and help them out in a shorter period of time. Maybe maybe probably max ninety days. Okay. Uh, and make meaningful change in the organization in ninety days. So talking to people, sitting with teams, deep, I deep dive with teams. Uh, uh, sitting in on their events, giving them advice, helping them out, helping them look at their data and understand what's going on, uh, build Kanban boards, right? Because that's that's a lot of work, build their workflows. Yeah. Um, but also I work with leadership teams as well, helping them understand how they can engage with teams, push responsibility down the organization and democratize and decentralize, decentralize their organizational structures. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure we include links to your, your company and your LinkedIn profile in the show notes so folks can, can reach out and get in touch. Um, uh, thanks so much for joining us on Amazing Applications today. It's, it's been great to meet you, and um, I've been following a lot of your content on LinkedIn for such a long time. A wonderful conversation today. Martin Hinchelwood, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Steve. That was Amazing Apps, episode 146 with Martin Hinchelwood from Naked Agility. Did Martin challenge any of your long-held beliefs? If he did, head on over to the customary company page on LinkedIn, follow the page and comment on this episode's posts. If more people like you in our community discover and listen to this podcast, we'll be able to attract more and more awesome guests like Martin to share their knowledge and experience with us. In the next episode, I've got a guest that holds the opposite belief to Martin. He's the director for Dynamics 365 in the manufacturing industry for one of Microsoft's most successful partners. He's built his entire career on helping Microsoft customers, especially manufacturers, gain competitive advantage by building on Dynamics 365 instead of custom .NET apps. Make sure you follow or subscribe to Amazing Apps in your podcast player or on YouTube so you don't miss it. Until then, keep experimenting.